So I thought I would give us a little bit of a blast from the past. Uh, this is a representation of my mom and dad. Uh, my mom was a, an accountant with math degree, and my dad did uh, early programming work for the government. So I remember coloring on punch cards when I was a child. And you might imagine that the product of two such parents would produce something like this. Uh, so this is a representation of me, and maybe some of you remember this device. Um, I also thought I would share with you my first computer merely as a way to show you how far we've come from that. Did anyone else have this computer? The TI-99-4A, excellent, yeah, it was great. The math graphics on it in particular were fantastic. If you don't remember what the 80s looked like, here you go. So if we fast forward this quite a few years to today, we have all sorts of uh, software today uh, that gives us a lot more abilities to do math. We have things like uh, Wolfram Alpha, which indexes all of the easy to access data in the world. We have great graphing technologies that we can use to quickly find regressions and graph on, on phones and other devices. Uh, we have software that can help students as they're learning the math on their, at, at home. Um, you don't just have to look at the back of the book anymore. There's more to it than that. Uh, we have learning management systems that allow us to kind of index the resources available for classes, give assessments, etc. We have technology to allow us to meet with students outside of class in our own bedrooms to see, you know, who's got underwear hanging out of their drawers and who doesn't. Um, we have handheld technology that can be used for good or for evil, right? Uh, sometimes for good, like in the case of photographing notes on the board. Um, these are students who are using the graphing technology on their phones. Heretical, I know. Um, so the question is, what happens now? Like, we have all of this technology. Where does this really leave us? In particular, where does this leave math professors? Uh, if you haven't had this thought at least once or twice over the last few years of, like, if the computers can do all the math, then where does that leave me, right? I mean, you've got to at least have had this niggling thought somewhere in your head. I've got for you today four predictions for the age of technology enhanced learning. And actually, since you're math professors, I thought you could handle this. There's actually 4.5 predictions for the age of technology enhanced learning. I wouldn't try this in normal audiences, but I think, I think we're good here. So the first, before we get to the predictions, I just want to remind you of the Arthur Clarke quote. Anyone that can be replaced by a computer should be. And the real question of this presentation is, can what you do, can what we teach be replaced by a computer? And the question is not, should it be replaced if that's the case? It should be. The question is, can we do something better? Okay, so that's what I intend to walk you through. So the first prediction I have about technology enhanced learning is that learning involving information transfer is going to be taught by technology. And Information transfer, something like a lecture, it's just a kind of technology. And to point that out, I thought we would go through a, a fairly simple technology that you're all familiar with, and that is the technology of reading. Reading is actually a technology that has only been around for the masses for a couple hundred years. Now, yes, there were scholars, religious scholars and nobles who could read, you know, a thousand years ago, but that was not the masses, that was the elite. Te this technology for the masses is only a couple hundred years old. Genetically, we are not built for reading text. We shouldn't get so upset when students don't really want to read textbooks. It's not in our DNA to do this. In fact, reading as a technology, it's, it's actually kind of evolving back to talking as a technology. There's a reason students gravitate towards, can you just tell me? Can I watch the video? It's, it's the normal way of human communication. It's what we've done for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, if we go to reading, there's an interesting technology you may or may not have seen. You may think you know what reading looks like, but I'd like to invite you to try it in a new way. You guys all doing okay still? We're going to increase the speed now. Are you ready?
Okay, so I'm going to pause this. This is reading in a completely new way, right? It uses the optimal recognition points of words to focus your eye on the place where if you focus, you grab the whole word at once. This is not left to right, top to bottom reading. This is something else. It's a different technology for what you're used to, right? Here's another technology for what you're used to. It colors the ends and beginnings of lines to make it easier for students to move from one line to another on a page. For students who have low reading abilities or disabilities around reading, this can be very helpful to them. There are two things that they struggle with. One is letters turning on them. The other is getting from the end of one line to the beginning of the next. Again, these are just new technologies for reading. Just like reading, lecture is just a technology. It's a technology that was developed to disseminate information when books were very expensive. When you wanted to learn calculus, you went somewhere where a calculus teacher could tell you calculus and you could make your own hand copy of it. That is the origin of the lecture. We're seeing the lecture change now. If you watch carefully, it's changing, right? The lecture is changing into something that will replace it. It's going back to our original way of learning, listening to somebody else, watching what happens. We've seen all sorts of sites emerge to provide free lessons and free lectures on the internet. Uh, these are all ones that are particular to math. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, you want to remember how old that is? What year it started? It started this all, this whole online video movement. 2001, 16 years old now. So we have all of these sites that give uh, videos and, and certainly uh, we, we've seen them all used in classes and students coming in knowing about them. I thought I'd point out a few of the technologies around video that make it so compelling for us to use it over lecture. So this is actually video out of the edX platform, which has a really nice video package. They uh, not only have the videos captioned, but on the right hand side, you can see here that you see the script as the video moves. You can search that script. You can click on something in the script and it jumps the video to that spot, right? That's clearly better than sitting through the 15 or half an hour or one hour lecture where you can't jump the professor to that spot, right? Uh, you can speed the professor up or slow them down. Again, very valuable, right? In some cases, you want to speed them up. For a student who's, who's taking their classes in their second language, they may want to slow the professor down. Having the words at the right is a very valuable tool to them. They might not know what you just said when you said asymptote very quickly, right? They have no idea what you just said. It just sounded like blah, 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 right? If they can see the word next to it, if they can slow you down and hear it slowly, then they can learn a lot more that way, right? So having the transcripts, having the ability to speed up and slow down, jump around in the video, uh, search the, the, the transcript, that is all more valuable than watching a lecture. Lecture is just a technology. This is a better technology. So a second prediction is that any repetitive assessment or repetitive learning task that can be replaced by a computer will be. Okay? And for most of us, this doesn't bother us too much. I mean, how many of us really like to spend our weekends grading repetitive assessment items? Anyone? No? Okay. So, you know, we see all sorts of things emerge to try to help us with this practice of repetitive assessments. And math, honestly, had them all first, right? Math is the easiest thing for computers to do of all the subjects that we teach. The next one is computer science, right? Math, then computer science, then chemistry, uh, finance, economics, anything that's math-based, right? So math fell first to all of these things, right? And we have all sorts of a, a, an ecosystem that helps us do repetitive problems now. Of course, as soon as you create an ecosystem that allows you to do repetitive problems, an ecosystem arrives that helps students cheat at doing repetitive problems. And so we have all sorts of ways that that happens too, right? It's from phone scanners of problems on the, on the text to teams of people you can help. There is an A in teamwork. This is about helping you cheat in your math class, by the way. It's very nice marketing. <laughs> we have um, software that allows us to you know, go through and do the math uh, even you know, with steps, which is great. We build increasingly complex systems into our online homework. Of course, even the increasingly complex systems, we just build increasingly complex natural language processors to deal with the increasingly complex problems, right? So the same problem that you can do in a, in a math 
uh, platform, you can also get a lot of the work out of Wolfram Alpha, right? Which is very easy to do, and you can do it from your phone. But there's actually a bigger problem uh, lurking under the surface, and it's one that we don't like to talk about in math. It's this problem. The problem of why we still teach some of the things we taught back in the early 1900s. So for example, I've taught a lot of dev math in my life, and I've taught a lot of calculus in my life. And we teach months and months of dev math on things like factoring, right, months. And I'd like to ask you, actually, honestly, why we still teach this stuff. What's the purpose of factoring? You guys are a room of calculus teachers. Tell me, what's the purpose of factoring? Builds character. It builds character. <laughs> what else? Solving equations. Solving equations, so finding zeros, things like that. Seeing patterns. Seeing patterns. To understand the more fundamental concept of multiplication itself. To understand the more fundamental concepts of multiplication itself. I got a question about that one, though. Okay. Do you think that algebra students actually make that connection from learning factoring? They it's a tool. It's that a tool. Helps. Okay, so let me ask you this. I'm going to give you a polynomial, and I'd like you to tell me which of these techniques I use to find the zeros of this polynomial. Uh, that, that would be none of them. And, and in the real world, what's most likely to happen? A polynomial with decimal coefficients or a polynomial with integer coefficients? Decimal. And even if there were integer coefficients, how likely is it that it actually factors? Oh, not very likely. In fact, if we look at all sorts of real world graphs, like this is the, the SpaceX launch right here and angular position of Falcon 9. And how many of these graphs do you think produce something that's nicely factorable in any way, shape, or form? Zero. And so we spend all this time in dev math and all this time in, even in calculus working on problems that involve a lot of algebra. And I keep asking myself, why? So for example, the same problem we've been looking at in, in, um, in math platforms, and I looked at it in Wolfram Alpha for you too, this problem here is the, the math required to do this problem by hand. And even as a math teacher, you can see I factored in, improperly once, which is probably, as a math teacher, I only am factored improperly once. As a student, I would probably factor improperly at least 10 times. All right, so the, the problem here is trying to use you know, the first derivative to find where the function is increasing. Of course, the only calculus involved in the problem is those two highlighted steps, taking the derivative and then maybe connecting the, the sign chart of the derivative back to the function. Of course, I could actually have solved the problem with calculator technology, right? that I can use on my phone, which I happen to have with me everywhere, just, just pointing that out. I could even do the calculus here, like so now I took the first derivative and showed with the first derivative, you know, where, uh, where the function changes from increase to decreasing. So I could basically shortcut all of that math and just do these two steps here, right? So if you're in calculus class, should you be doing calculus? Not 90% algebra? When we say students struggle with math, they're struggling with the algebraic manipulation, and we shortcut all the concepts when we do this. Okay, so uh, you, just for the record, I could even do the, the derivatives out in here. I don't, I don't actually have to do the, the calculation. I can just do the, do the derivatives of the math. Um, I can do it with this fairly complicated polynomial, right? It's the same process now. It's not a completely different process. There's not a section that stands alone in the book that says, here are the problems that involve real world math user calculator. Everything just involves the same technology. But then there's still this argument, and I hear this argument a lot of time from math, math teachers. But the student might be trapped on a desert island with no calculator. Now, how many of you guys saw the TV show Lost? They were trapped in a desert island with no calculator, right? What were their primary concerns? Food, water, escape. Factoring. Factoring. <laughs> no, not factoring, right? I would guess that if we were in a post-apocalyptic event or stranded on a desert island, either of those would produce a population who is more interested in food, water, and escape than 
being able to do the math by hand. And even in that case, we could go back to books and relearn it. We're smart people. So, um, so this is my heretical 2.5 prediction. Um, if we insist on continuing to teach algebraic manipulations that are useless in the real world, math departments are going to lose their classes to other disciplines. You may see this at your, at your school where psychology has decided to teach its own psychology version of stats, or engineering has decided to teach its own more technology-laden version of calculus, or the, the community colleges are, are trying to eliminate dev math everywhere they can because they know that it's a six semester barrier to success. Why? So that students can learn to factor? For what reason? There are other ways we can teach logic. We need to look at every topic in calculus, calculus being the downstream of all of these classes. The reason I teach what I teach in beginning algebra is because of calculus. The reason I teach what I teach in college algebra is because of calculus. It's preserving this pipeline, right? You might say, well, but that pipeline is super important. What about the unicorns? There could be unicorns in these classes. We'd be doing them a disservice by leaving out the algebraic manipulations. Why don't we just teach a course called algebraic manipulations then? And when the unicorns arrive at the decision to become a math major, we can teach them all this fun stuff. But we don't have to teach it to everybody. OK, anyways, I digress. We'll go back to technology. I just had to stick that in here, because this is a group of calculus instructors. I so rarely get a chance uh, to talk to them. So my next prediction is that a computerized course that's cheaper and results in equal or better learning outcomes for students is going to get delivered that way, even if it's fully computerized. Now, the trick here is the stuff in red here, equal or better learning outcomes. We haven't yet seen a, a fully computerized course that results in equal or better learning outcomes, except to a very self-determined set of students. Now, you guys all teach students. What percentage of students are capable of, like, you hand them a textbook and they could learn the class on their own? It's not a very high percentage, right? Are there students who can do it? Yeah, there's always been, right? But not a lot. So this one might sound scary, and I think it is true economically. If we could find a cheaper way to teach calculus, we'd do it, right? That's just the economics of it. Um, we have all sorts of platforms that have investigated whether or not they can, in fact, teach uh, students cheaper than educational institutions. Um, there's these kind of drastic discount uh, courses down here that offer, you know, college for $99 a month. There's been explorations of free by all the MOOC platforms. Incidentally, not a lot of them are still offering a full free um, menu of courses. Um, what I see happening and what I saw in the last five years was this kind of view from Silicon Valley uh, through Silicon Valley tinted glasses. This idea that teachers and education could be replaced. Okay, and this is how their vision kind of goes. All the learners are motivated. Everyone has internet. And the only thing standing between a student and their success is affordable access. Right? And so based on this, we saw the rise of MOOCs. We can put 50,000 students in a class, a computer will teach them, they will all learn, drop out of college, and do this on their own, right? And this isn't surprising given that the Silicon Valley tinted glasses were from founders and entrepreneurs who themselves dropped out of college, learned things on their own, and went on to build companies. They were the autodidacts, the self-guided learners. They modeled what they built off of how they learned. It was a very naive look at education. It's not how you learn, it's how the masses learn. And we know in reality that this, this Lake Wobegon view of education isn't right. We know that all the learners are on Facebook and Snapchat. Uh, the internet doesn't sometimes work on campus. And the only thing standing between a student and their success is the ability to actually sit down and learn without distractions. Right? It's not access that's the problem, it's distraction and focus. So going back to this idea that a computer could replace your class, a lot of professors will say, no wait, computer cannot replace what I do in the classroom. 
right? What I do in the classroom, it's interactive. I, you know, we, we answer and ask a lot of questions. You can't replace that with a video or with a, with a program, right? So I thought I would show you just a little bit of research, and I'll warn you that this particular research will haunt you. So once you see it, you can't actually unsee it, and I apologize for that. Not really, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so this was research done out of the University of Michigan, and it looked at um, mapping out all the interactions in math classrooms. Okay? So I'm going to show you three math classrooms. There's a legend on each of these. Um, the important part is that the questions and answers are the stars and the bubbles, and the instructor is the triangle in each of these pages. So here's the first classroom. We're getting kind of a bird's eye view. The top here is the front of the room. Here's the professor, the triangle, right? And here are all the students in a room. This is recorded over an hour. So this is an hour of interactions in this math classroom. And now, from the point of view of, of the instructor, is the class highly interactive? I mean, they asked a lot of questions, right? And they answered some questions. So did they have interactions in this class? Yeah. And, you know, these three students in the front row, they also had a lot of interactions, right? The second row? Not so much. Back row, a little bit. This part of the front row, not so much. Right? So a lot of the class is lurking. We use this, on the, this term on the internet, right? Lurking. A lot of the class is lurking. Different classroom, different instructor, different students. Is this class highly interactive for the instructor? Yeah, like even more than the last one, right? This instructor probably leaves class going, yes, that was a fantastic class. I asked, look how many questions they're asking. I asked so many questions. It was amazing. But it was amazing for the instructor and like how many students? Four. Yeah, and, and for those of you pointing this out, yes, the back row fell asleep, arrived late, um, etc. Okay, one more class just because it's good to have pattern here. <laughs> Highly interactive for the instructor? And whoop, Mike's dead. Did I press it, maybe? Is that back? OK, I just pressed it. My bad. Um, and one student, right? Highly interactive for the instructor and one student. The reason these will now haunt you if they haven't already start. I didn't do it that time. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll just have to talk. You guys will have to find a better mic. So this is highly interactive for the instructor and one student, right? This is going to haunt you because when you now look at the classes you teach, if you're not already reflecting on the classes you teach, you will now see the three students who talk to you in class. Because in fact, the classroom is highly interactive, thank you, for the teacher and it's engaging for about three students. And everybody else is lurking. Now, there's not no value in lurking, but you, yeah. But if, if somebody's in class, it's not interacting, doesn't mean that they don't benefit from it. That's what I just said. That's what I just said, right? It doesn't mean that there's no benefit from lurking. There is some benefit for lurking. But we know that there's a lot of benefit from interaction, and I'm going to show you some of the research for that. So, for example, uh, one of the seminal studies in this is the Bloom 2 Sigma study. You're probably familiar with Benjamin Bloom from Bloom's Taxonomy. We can all now have a, a global eye roll about that one. Um, but he actually did some research about um, group instruction, lecture, and one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And this is a fantastic paper to read. And, and I'm going to summarize it in one graphic. You can go read the whole paper. But what he found, he was trying to show how effective group group instruction was. And what he found was actually that tutoring with mastery techniques beats group instruction by one standard deviation, and it beats lecture by two standard deviations. So then the question becomes, well, why is it that tutoring is so much better than something like lecture or group instruction, right? I'm going to actually make the fourth prediction here, and then I'm going to go into some more research around that. My fourth prediction is that the only technology that's really going to improve outcomes for the majority of students is a technology that begins to mimic a tutor-student relationship. Okay, and so here's why. 
So now we look at some of the follow-up research to this. So this is a great paper on, on learning from human tutoring, and then there's a whole bunch of follow-up papers to this one. But this particular paper does a whole lot of experiments around what is it, particularly around tutoring, that makes tutoring so valuable. And one of the surprising findings of this study was that it's actually the number of interactions in the tutoring, not the content expertise or the dissemination of content. It's the number of interactions that actually increases the learning. In particular, it increases, I was just saying, in particular, it increases the deep learning outcomes. Those are the ones that last past a couple of weeks or the ones that allow the, the content to transfer to another subject. So even if what you see on the short term, and this is what's really hard about active learning techniques, in the short term, if you're just giving the test a week after they learned it, you're going to see the same results from active learning as from passive learning. If you look a month from now, or you look at the ability to transfer that content to some other subject, the active learning techniques win. But we rarely do that in education. We rarely look at that except to hear from our stakeholders and other subjects that things are going badly for them. Um, this study also looked at when was the appropriate time to actually deliver that content, to deliver that piece of lecture. And it turns out that the time to deliver that is when it's actually sought out. So when the student actually says, I actually need a piece of information, that is the time to deliver it. Now that's really hard to do in a one to 30 environment or a one to 100 environment, but it can be done with technology. Um, another follow-up study to this one, why do some events, only some events cause learning during, during human tutoring? The whole body of research from this group. Uh, and what they find is that, sorry, this is where I hand draw research. Um, uh, but you can go read the papers, I promise it's in there, is that successful learning appears to happen when the student reaches an impasse. If you think about why you went into teaching, a lot of people say, well, I went into teaching because I wanted to see the aha moments of students. Keep this in mind, an aha moment only happens after the student was stuck. If you're never stuck, you don't go, ah, oh, I get it. Right? You have to actually be stuck or a little bit confused or a little bit stumped by a problem. So we need to bring students to this point where they reach impasse. Again, something hard to do in a 1 to 30 or a 1 to 100 environment. Get your whole class to impasse at the same time. Good luck with that. <laughs> Not so easy. So software can help us with this because we can basically make a map from like initial knowledge to mastery of something and we can send every student through on a path that's unique to them, theoretically, right? So one student might you know, be asked a question, we realize they know this topic already, we mark them off as mastered and we move them on. Where another student might have a long and winding path through that stuff, right? They, they hit some impasse moments, they get delivered some content after those moments, right? We ask them some more questions. Every student can have a different path through this. Some of them may you know, end up in a circle for a little while. That also happens during tutoring, right? And so the idea here is that in the learning process, we should allow for differences between students, right? Every student may have their own path. And with, soft, with the right software, we can deliver the content at the moment they need it, rather than delivering the content up front when they haven't expressed a need for it yet. OK, so what if you don't have the software yet to do this? I mean, math is probably going to get it first, because we always get the software first. But you know, what if you don't have the software at your school for this yet? We can still do things in classes to begin to mimic this relationship. And I think we should start doing that. So for example, we can have students work uh, problems themselves. So this is just a little uh, live shot from a classroom I used to teach in, where the students, you see they're not being lectured to, they're actually working problems, right? It's the interactions that are important not the content expertise of the person tutoring. So students tutoring each other, it's just as effective as them, it's more effective than, the, than listening to you. Because what are they doing? They're using the vocabulary, they're talking to each other, they're teaching each other, they're doing it in a language that makes most sense to them, right? They're hitting impasse, they're helping each other through impasse, all of those things we know we need, right? Now maybe you don't have a lot of whiteboards, you can also you know, do this at tables. I recommend that if you do this, you know, in groups like this, there's one key thing here in all of these groups. You can see they're all hunched over a single sheet of paper. 
you want students to work together in class, I highly recommend you never give them more than one sheet of paper with the problem. If you give them four sheets of paper for four students, what happens? They all work individually. And it's like pulling teeth to get them to talk to each other. If you give them one sheet of paper, now they have no choice but to talk to each other because they have to look at the paper together and come to inclusion together. You can also give them, you can see here these little lap boards, you can also have them do work on lap boards if you don't have a lot of whiteboards. And you can even put the lap boards at the front of the room to discuss what all the groups did, right? So there's a lot of things you can do to increase the level of interaction in person, even without the software there, right? And if you use some kind of software to support it, you get even more time in class to do this other stuff, this human-centered stuff, this interaction-centered stuff. So I thought I would make a, one more point in this presentation that's, that's really important to me. Um, I love this quote. How do I get somebody to learn something that's long and difficult and takes a lot of commitment, but get them to learn it well? And when I first read this quote, I was sure we were talking about math. But in fact, we're talking about video games. <laughs> and it's always interesting to me that the same students who have a really hard time learning derivative rules and integration rules and exponent rules, uh, they can learn all of the mappings of these joysticks to you know, 20 different computer programs, right? But they learn it in a different way than we teach them. When you're learning to play a game, it goes something like this. You give it a try, uh, you push around at the edges of the game, you explore the, the, the world you're in, the level you're on, you try what happens if I kick, what happens if I punch, what happens if I jump. Um, you fail a lot, you try over and over, and you seek patterns in that. And what this does is it creates a very rich problem space. So if I'm the student here at the center, every one of those explorations leads me to a space in my mind where I've tried some things and I know what failed and what succeeded, right? And in doing that, I'm also able to then make connections between the places where I failed and succeeded. And I can say like, oh, well, exploring this level was similar to exploring that level. Even if I don't always make progress, I learn from that exploration, right? And I build a variety of jumping off points that I can use to solve the next level I get, which is very similar to when we like, want students to be able to solve the next problem we give them. And then they say, but that wasn't like any of the problems you gave me before. This one involved Mary, and the last problem involved Alice, right? And so therefore, I cannot do this problem, right? They need lots of jumping off points to get there. Unfortunately, the way we tend to do things in education, primarily because we're trying to teach so much content, is we teach like this. We tell them what we're going to tell them. We tell them. We tell them what we told them, and then we have them practice repetitively. Right? And we do this because, and I'm sure every one of you will say this, but I don't have time to do anything else. There's so much stuff in these classes. I don't have time to do anything else. But what we do is create that problem space where all I did was tell them exactly how to find a derivative with powers, exactly how to find a derivative with use of, or an integral with use of, I, I told them exactly how to do things, but I didn't give them any time or space to explore it. And then we end up with this reduced problem space, this problem space where when their physics teacher gives them a problem right here, what do they do? They say, I never learned how to do derivatives in physics because I never explored anything. All I know is how to do derivatives involving factoring. And this problem doesn't use factoring, so I'm stuck, right? I mean, we teach them exa very exacting methods and then are surprised when they can't apply it to other things. We have to give them a, a way to explore where they get more jumping off points. That means we have to free up some time somewhere to do this. There's a whole body, don't take my word for this, there's a whole body of research around this, this productive failure in mathematical problem solving. This is a research group out of Singapore, and they've written article after article after article about the importance of, of this exploration space. And what they find is that even if they put students through a problem solving situation where for weeks they can't solve the problem, these students still walk away successfully being able to solve simpler problems. Now, they perform the same as the students who were lectured in the short term, but what do you suppose happens in the long term? They're better. They can, they can 
deal with problems from other subjects. They can deal with what they call novel problem situations because they have lots of experience exploring around the edges of what we give them. So as much as we can, I think we have to replicate spaces that allow for productive failure, encounter with impasse, and exploration. We have to do that in our physical classrooms because we, we certainly don't have software that does this yet, right? We can use the software to leverage time back in our classes, right? So if you have to cover as much content as you have to cover until something changes, then you can use the technology to do some of that content coverage and free up the time in class to do other things. So we can also give different kinds of problems. Um, the non-repetitive problems. Remember the repetitive problems, those get graded by computers now. So the non-repetitive problems. So for example, uh, one technique I've used in classes is called elaboration. And so what you do is you give the student you know, a, a handwritten problem to do, but they don't get graded just on that problem, they get graded on elaborating on the problem. So they can do anything outside the problem that wasn't asked for them to do in the problem. right? So here in the light color is what they actually need to do to solve the problem. And then what they elaborated on, this student chose to check the problem to elaborate. This next student checked the problem and graphed it to show how to solve the problem as another way, right? This student, same type of problem, this is the problem right here, this would be the elaboration, right? They not only checked the problem, figured out a mistake, fixed the problem, but then they decided to see what would happen if you just squared individual pieces in the problem instead of squaring the whole side and they learned it didn't work, right? This is exploring the space around the problem. And there's a lot of conversations that happen with students when you give them the ability to open up their mind to, to, the, to the work around what was asked. I have like a blog post about, you know, what is an elaboration, how you grade it, et cetera. There's a link down here you can write down if you want that blog post. Um, you could, I will post the slides after this so you can just get it from that as well. But basically, they have to show something else. That's anything else that has to do with the problems. They can even do it wrong, as long as they tried something else. And we can talk about what was wrong. What's interesting about elaborations is they make it onto exams once the students are used to doing it. So like, students actually check their work. Nothing in this problem said they had to check their work. Students check their work on exams. It's shocking. All right, so the thing you always wanted them to do, and now they, and, and they even leave little notes like both work, look, I checked, right? Um, they do things like, uh, it makes it easier for me to ask, to ask open-ended questions because they're used to elaborating. So rather than just saying, you know, what's the horizontal asymptote of this function, or what's the vertical asymptote of this function, I can just say, give me five mathematical properties of this function. And they're used to exploring. And now I'm not asking for the one thing they may not know, I'm asking for them to tell me five things that they do know for sure about this, right? And that's a very different kind of workspace. Again, you can do these kinds of problems, they don't have to be on exams, we do these kinds of problems in, in class, like tell me five properties of this function. Any five, I can write 10, let's see if you can write five, then pass it to the next group and see if you can add two to theirs and pass it to the next group and grade whether you'd accept these answers or not. There's all sorts of things you can do, but you're getting them interacting, you're letting them explore, explore spaces, you're letting them hit things that they shouldn't be saying. Like some will say, give it an exponential function, some will say, oh, there's a vertical asymptote, which there's not, right? But now you've got them to say that and you can talk about it. Why do you think there's a vertical asymptote? Why isn't there a vertical asymptote? Things that you don't normally get to poke at. So I think, what we have to do here, if you think about these four predictions, four and a half predictions, really, I think that educators have to shift from the role of an instructor to the role of a coach, your learning coach. What you do in person is very coach-oriented. In person, good coaches do these things. They communicate, they question, they challenge, they hold the learners accountable, um, they show new perspectives, they monitor how their players are doing, how, their, how the learners are doing, right? These are qualities of a good modern day instructor, too, your coach. So just to recap, so learning that involves information transfer will be replaced by technology. Just let it. Don't, don't fight it forever. There's no reason why every single math instructor in the United States needs to make their own set of lecture videos. And there's no reason why you have to repeat the same lecture a thousand times in your lifetime. 
if at least make your own set of lecture videos and stop repeating the lecture yourself, right? Like at least get that far. But there's no reason why it even has to be you. Any repetitive assessment or learning tasks that can be replaced by a computer will be. I think you should embrace this. You should love this. It will leverage your in-class time for you. But don't have it be the sole source of evaluation. It's not enough. If it was enough, nobody would actually need to learn the math. The computers can all do the math for us, right? So if you believe that there's more to math than just what computers do, you have to have more evaluation than just what the technology does. I would also just remind you that good coaches monitor the stats of their players. Good coaches monitor the stats coming out of these systems. If you're never looking at the data coming out of the technology systems you use, you are not doing your job fully. 2.5, if we insist on continuing to teach stuff that's useless in the real world, we're going to lose ownership of math classes. I think this has to change. Now, it's possible that many of you in this room, this change might take 10 years. It might take 10 years to lose all those math classes, and you might be retired by then, which is great for you. But it really sucks for those, those, those unicorns who are coming up through the ranks to teach math. It really sucks for them. They don't want to lose their classes. We need to do something, and the change has to go all the way up through calculus because all these classes downstream are teaching esoteric, manipulative algebra for the sole purpose of getting students to calculus. And until calculus changes, none of those classes can change either. Third, computerized courses that are cheaper and result in equal or better learning outcomes will be delivered that way. We can create better in-person experiences. If we create better in-person experiences, then we're never going to see this equal or better. Because what we do in class, what we do as humans, is going to be better. And then finally, uh, the technology that's going to actually improve learning outcomes for the majority of the students is that that mimics student-tutor relationships. I just wanted to point out that the learning phase and the assessment phase are two different things. It's okay for students to learn differently. You may still have to assess them all in a fair and equal way, but that's not the same as learning, right? And I think we can push the software platforms we use and the technologies that we look into to be better and better at mimicking this relationship, at providing the resources at the moment of impasse, at asking questions, at allowing more exploration, things like that. So anyone that can be replaced by a computer should be. I've seen math instructors across the country who say, oh, I love fill in the blank math program. I just press on at the beginning of the semester and I don't have to do anything for the rest of the semester. To which I say, anyone that can be replaced by a computer should be. If that's really all that happens in your class. Can I just hire the computer? Their benefits are a lot lower. I thought I would leave you with this last example, the interesting case of pharmacy in the US. Pharmacists were actually facing a crisis about a decade ago. Robot pill counting machines turned out to be better at counting pills than pharmacists. Computers turned out to be better at finding drug interactions than pharmacists. So the question was, well, what are pharma, where, what's going to happen to the pharmacy industry if computers and robot counting machines can replace them and do a better job. And so pharmacists, when faced with this, did not dig in their heels and say, you'll have pharmacists anyways. They said, well, what can we do differently? How can we serve the needs of the community better? And so now what you see in, in drug stores all across the US is pharmacists who have taken on new roles. Pharmacists now give vaccinations. Pharmacists now serve as the front line to patients with chronic illnesses. Patients with chronic illnesses are always going to their pharmacist and asking them for advice. So pharmacists now ask questions like, you know, do, do you have any sores on your feet? Do you have any change in appetite? You, all of those questions that you, uh, normally a doctor would ask, but you only see them once a year. The pharmacists now ask when medications are refilled. So pharmacists actually became, for the most part, PharmD programs now, where pharmacists actually get doctorates, and they can serve as a front line to the medical community, to patients who see pharmacists a lot. Right? They protected 
their their uh, pra their profession by evolving. And I think we just do the same. We protect our practice by evolving, not by hunkering down and protecting the, the techniques from the 1900s, but by evolving and really teaching math that's real world and applicable that any student can use in the real world because they know how to do it on their phone, which is what they carry with them, right? When their chemistry professor says in a lab, here's a set of data, you know, what can you do with it? They say, I know what to do with it. I'm pulling out my phone. I can graph this data, I can find regressions on this data, I can find the concavity points, the inflection points, things like that. They only know how to do that if we teach them how to do it that way. So I think stop wasting time doing things that a computer can do better. That's one piece of advice. The other is to specialize on, on being and doing what humans do best. And that's fostering all of those, those interaction points, exploration, etc. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>